Welcome everybody to a special edition of Live from My Drum Room. Today, my very special guest is my old friend, Matt Sorum. Uh, no stranger to all you drummers. Drummer for The Cult, Guns N' Roses, Velvet Revolver, Kings of Chaos, uh, Hollywood Vampires, a million, a million more gigs. Uh, so I'm really excited to have Matt here with me today. And um, he's making time because he's a busy man. And so without any further ado, I'm going to welcome my old buddy, old meaning from a long time, Matt Sorum. What? What are you <laughs> busting into my house on Zoom? What the hell is going on? Uh, you know, that's what happens when you leave your camera on. You know, you never know who's going who's gonna to zoom, zoom in on you. Wow, I'm just like hanging out here in Palm Springs next to my wife's closet, <laughs> counting all the dollars I've spent on shoes and bags from years of drumming. This is the proof of the pudding right here. That's that's what, you know, working your ass off for the last 35 years is, you know, that's what you get. You get to buy your wife some really nice stuff. Well, you know, you got to pay, you got to pay the piper. You know what that's I'm saying? Right. Yeah. You have you want to have fun? Well, hey. Guess what? <laughs> Well, you know what they say, happy wife, happy life. Oh, so. I learned that the hard way, you know, it took me a while, but yeah. I figured it out finally. <laughs> it's good to see you, buddy, man. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate you making time. I, I, I want to like tell everybody that by the time this airs a couple of weeks from now, your book will already be out. But I, uh, Matt is releasing his autobiography on May 10th and, um, when I reached out to you a couple of weeks ago, I didn't know this. I just felt like we were long overdue to do something like this. And then I found out you had this book coming out and the timing's perfect. So, so thanks for doing this. Yeah. Well, no, I'm, I'm, I cancel everybody else, but you, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, I know that guy. <laughs> Thank you. I know you're probably doing and, a ton uh, of these and I, and I appreciate it. No, I I'm serious. I'm not kidding you. I said, oh, wow. John, we go, we go back to like 89 that's right. The cult. That's right, man. And there was you, a guy, Mike Morse. It's Zildjian. Soul. I know. I know. Matt, I got to tell you, I actually looked up the date because I knew it was 89. I started at Zildjian that summer, that, that May. And I found the date. It was July, maybe July something, 1989, Worcester Centrum, the cult, and, and uh, Metallica. Yeah. You guys are on tour with Metallica. And... Jimmy, uh, Timmy Doyle had called me like ahead of time and needed some stuff for you. And, and as you said, our old friend, Mike Morris had said, you got to check out Matt Sorum, man. I didn't know you then. I hadn't met you yet. Yeah. Um, I was so blown away. I was so, you know, I mean, Lars is Lars, Metallica is Metallica, but you, you stole the show. The cult stole the show that night, as far as I was concerned. And I feel like we, we were like instant buds. You were so cool and like immediately like you had that big smile on your face hey man you know thanks for coming you know and um yeah it was the beginning of a great friendship yeah that was cool man because we were up in your neighborhood are you still living up there in that way i am yep i'm still just outside of boston and um i mean and and I, not surprisingly it was only less than a year later that you were asked to join guns and roses right or maybe even six yeah, months about, or something uh, uh, just around two years we did that tour and i thought man this is great i'm in a band i'm on a bus and you know i was happy i i felt like i had arrived you know yeah, and then yeah and then along came that other opportunity and i was like oh my god this is crazy Whew, and man. uh then it then it took off in a in a really crazy wild ride i always used to say if anyone remembers old school disneyland they used to be what's called the e-ticket and you used to go to Disneyland and you would get E, D, C. It was different tickets for different rides. And I say, I got the E ticket for Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be confused with Ginger Baker, but. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, things are off and it, it, it got really kooky. And Timmy Doyle came with me on that trip. Yeah. And yep. uh, we, we, we took off as a team and. You know, it was great. That probably helped. I got to, I have to think that moving into, I mean, Guns N' Roses at that time, there was no band bigger in the world. And, 
And to have your kind of right hand man there with you had to be at least, you know, help you through that kind of a transition from as big as the cult was going well, to. I remember band. calling you guys and going, I need really big symbols. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I had a 24 inch ping ride. I don't know if you remember, but that thing was massive. Yes. And in those days, you know, we didn't have in ears, man. It was just pure volume on stage. And, you know, Slash wielding like four Marshall stacks. And, you know, there was, I think, eight Galeon Krieger amps. And underneath my drum riser, I remember I had four 18-inch speakers for kick drum. Just like, so and believe it or not, as crazy as this sounds, you're outdoors on this massive stadium stages and i'm like turn it up and <laughs> man the joke was get mad a porta potty because the low end was serious and yeah. uh but you kind of had to have it you know and i remember calling you guys and going hey i want the biggest symbols possible because i needed the decay to last so yeah. you know i wanted to go Boosh! and Cause I remember I used to go see bands and cymbals would just go like, Bruce. and I'm like, yeah, what was yeah. that? It sounded like, you know, <laughs> yeah, some yeah. guy's up there playing like a 16 or something and he's in front of a big rock band. I'm like, that's not going to cut it, man. No, no. I just remember Bonham going, bah, bah, boo, 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 boo. I'm like, that, that's gotta be a 20. Yeah. It's at least yeah. a 20 inch crash. So I went, I remember going, the smallest was 18. I went up to 19, 20, and I actually had a 20 two crash as well on the backside yeah for that yeah. and you were playing in. yeah and you were playing a rock crashes too i think which were the heavier ones and they you know they it's were always. louder yeah yeah, yeah it was I, all a's yeah. in those days it's funny now i hear a's and i'm like ah i know you know, know. i'm a full k guy now i'm like i don't know if that comes with age or whatever but now i hear an a and i'm like oh <laughs> you know i have a couple still that'll break out for the right bell thing. Like, yeah, I have all my, I have my original, original Zildjian 15 inch hats rocks. Wow. And, wow. and they were the ones I played on all those tours. And I remember thinking guys were like, wow, you're playing 15s. I'm like, well, yeah. Yeah. Now I play 16s. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. I play those 16, um, uh, Zilge, uh case the k like the k light 16 is that what they got called? both i got the sweets yeah. and i oh, got and the, the yeah. yeah i got the k lights and then because i was playing with gibbons yeah and he really likes a wide because it's a three-piece he likes like a wider hat and a little bit oh, slightly open but kind of like filling up the space yeah and yeah with like a whoosh, kind yeah. of thing so <laughs> as you whoosh, yeah and I'm like, give me some 16s. And he loved them. I'll bet. Yeah. Because he didn't really, if you watch ZZ Top now, like Frank Beard plays his, the hats a little bit more open. Mm -hmm. But back in the 70s, all those guys played the hat really tight. Really tight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. But for live, Billy's like, open up the hat. Open up the hat. He didn't like that that tight thing live. Yeah. So but like, you, like wow. you say, it fills in a lot of space when you, when you open those hats, just a little bit, it just a little bit more air, a little bit more space. Yeah. If you think yeah. about those great seventies records, everything was super dry. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't like big, massive reverbs and shit till the eighties. Right. And exactly. everything had its space, but the drumming was tight. Thumpy drums. Boom, boom, boom. Yep. That's, right. Yep. And I love that because I and I would go back and study those early records as easy top and play it exactly like that. Billy go open up the hat a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. What you know, cool, I would play man. the rest of it pretty yeah. similar, you know. That's so cool. That's so cool. Well, when I saw you with the cult, I remember and I, I could correct me if I'm wrong, I I could be wrong about this, but I I were you playing like two Chinas in front like Terry Bozio? Or yeah, I loved Terry in those days. When he when he when Terry went into missing persons, every drummer in town, you know, from Bissonette to me to everyone was like, dude, have you seen Terry Bozio? Yeah. And we'd all go out and watch 
Terry play when he had the crazy hair. Yeah. And you go, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and we all got big pangs. <laughs> and, and I used to say, I had those pangs to deflect shoes opening for Metallica. It's like, <laughs> but literally, I swear to God, like we would open for Justice for All. And it was like, yeah. In those days, you remember, you saw I do. it. Yeah, I saw it. It was 90, 95% dudes that were like, <laughs> and they didn't really care for the cult, you know? <laughs> we were like a, yeah. a girl band, you know? We were like, so some shoes did come up and those pangs and will save my ass. <laughs> I, I think like, he told me this. I think I, you know, <laughs> but, but yeah, I had two pangs. Yeah. I, I started out with like three rack toms. I remember that. Yep. And by the end of the tour, I was like, I'm going to strip it down and go to one rack. And I simplified my whole setup from my career going forward. So you had already when you when, by the time you got in Guns N' Roses you had you had changed your setup to what you ended up with the like you say the more simplified because when I saw you, you had exactly you had three rack toms maybe two floor toms yeah it was two floors yeah. the two chimes and you reminded me I mean in a in a in a like a um, not not in any way copying Terry but it you you were remin you know I could tell he was an influence in some of the stuff you were playing and it's you incorporated that, you know. that yeah. yeah. <laughs> And the, I mean, the cult's so straight, you know, so sort of like straight ahead, but you were incorporating some cool shit, like some really. Yeah, double bass stuff. drums were not acceptable with the cult, right? I mean, there's yeah. a story in my book where I auditioned for David Lee Roth and Steve Vai and Billy Sheehan, the early, early version of the band that Greg Bisson and him ended up getting. All these yeah. drummers went down to SIR to. To, to rehearse or or audition right and i remember uh going in there it was like mark craney and remember mark craney oh yeah man sure uh from gino vanelli and yeah jeff rotel oh so great great drummer All these guys were in line i'm like i'm going home <laughs> <laughs> like this is like it's out of my league and i remember going in there and steve by there was a double bass drum kit that they had rented and I went and sat down behind the kit and I actually picked up one bass drum and moved it. And, and Steve, I goes, Hmm, what are you doing? I go, I don't play double bass. <laughs> and he went, Hmm. Oh man. One demerit. Right? <laughs> and, and so I ended up playing, I grew up with me in pace and like Bonham and it was all about one pedal. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I ended up not getting the, um, the, the gig, obviously. And out of that, I ended up going on to play with Ed Mann, though, the vibes player from Frank Zappa's band. Steve I said, know. hey, I got this drummer. I think he'd be really good for you guys, which was real outside shit for me. It was. Oh, yeah. But I was into like Return to Forever. And, you know, I loved Al D. Miola, Lenny White, and Billy Cobham. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, I would, you know, I can't say. I'm there without any more, but when I was younger, I was pretty well versed in a lot of that flam accent fills. And well, <clears throat> so anyway, I ended up playing yeah. with him, but then, then I went and I, and I'm like, shit, man, I bet I better woodshed my double kick playing. Right. So I got a, I got a double bass kit. I remember it was a, it was a Tama kit. And uh, I don't remember how I got a hold of it. But I basically sat in there all day and just, right? I was like, <laughs> and, and I went in to audition for the cult and I set that big kid up and they walked in and went, no, no double bass. So I went, oh man. At that I got this point, shit down. <laughs> yeah. At that point, I picked up the bass drum again, moved it, set my setup the way I. And then I went, that's when I discovered the double pedal. And that was early days, you know, DW. Yeah. yeah. I believe it was a DW double pedal that I was using in those days. Because I I think early on, I signed a pedal deal with Chris Lombardi and John Good and those guys. Like I had a pedal deal. Right. Which was wacky, right? 
might have done. Let me see if I did all hardware in those days. I you think might have. no, no. I think I played Yamaha hardware because I was with Yamaha, and yes. that, how that happened was it was really funny. So I was managed by this guy Howard Kaufman, who also managed Tommy Aldridge and, and the band White Snake. Yeah. So when I got the cult gig. He said the drummer, uh, this guy walks in, his name's Jimmy Ayers, very famous. You know him from Aerosmith camp. Yeah, yeah, sure. He came in, he goes, hey, mate, uh, Jimmy Ayers, tour manager for the Colt. Uh, and I do White Snake, and we're going to get you a black Yamaha drum kit. You're endorsed. And, <laughs> and whatever you want, just pick it out. So from that moment on, because of Tommy Aldridge, I was Yamaha endorsee. So when I went to GNR, I shipped it straight over and I met Hoggy, Hoggy San. Yes. From Yamaha. <clears throat> and our old friend Steve Edelson. Yeah. Steve. Rest in peace is him as well. Our old buddy Steve. So Steve hooked me up and then I had I was I was ready. I was like, I got Zildjian, I got my Yamaha, and then Remo Belly. Yeah. Took me on. And that was great. Was you like, were representing. Wow. I mean, I got like everything I need. And I go, I better call Zildjian and get a gong. That's what I need. I need a gong. And it's like, <laughs> like growing up with Bonham and Keith Moon and those guys having gongs. I'm like, so rock and roll. Absolutely. Alan Van Halen. I remember I got a 38 inch gong. Big sucker. In fact, I think. I think at one point I came to see you and when Timmy sees this, I think he'll remember it. Timmy Doyle, we're talking about Matt's um, longtime drum tech from back in the day. And I feel like you cracked it at one point, cracked a gong and we didn't, we used to import them in. We, I think Zildjian still does imports them from Wuhan. Yeah. And sometimes we didn't have them in stock and Timmy was kind of freaking out because you needed one. We didn't have one. And he's like calling me every day and I'm going, Timmy, I, man, I don't know. It's, it's, you know, it's like, it's on the boat. It's going to be here, you know, next week or, uh, uh, but it being the good tech that he was, man, he was, <clears throat> he was on it. He was on it. Yeah. And he was trying well, to find a version of the Zildjian gong. There was the kind of like, I don't want to say it's low, more low quality, but there was, I know the one you mean. Yeah. <clears throat> I had that. That's the one I cracked. It yeah. wasn't Wuhan. Like Wuhan was like, wow. And you guys put the Zildjian name on it. Right. But I had the early version and I, those were kind of, I'm not saying, I'm not sure how they were cast. We got those from that. somebody else too. Yeah. It wasn't from Wuhan. I cracked it. Yeah. And you know, it's not like I'm the rock, heavy rock guy. Cause I grew up in wind ensemble. I'm like, you gotta warm that sucker up. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Boosh, boosh. <laughs> and uh, it went, <laughs> but the one that I had after that, was the same gong I had for 30 years. And I cracked it on the very last show of the Hollywood Vampires in 2016. Wow. It cracked after 30 years. That's that's a pretty long life, man. That's that's pretty amazing. And I was like, oh, it actually was very emotional for me. Yeah. I was like, oh. I mean, I mean, I'm just like, yeah, I mean, gongs can last forever, but at the same time, you know, moving it around and playing it and yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's not moving around a lot. That's the problem, you know, is being yeah. picked up and thrown on stages and right, right, right. I'd be like, I had a big anvil case for that sucker, you know, that thing yeah. rolled deep. I mean, it was, uh, but I ended up, uh, I haven't, re I don't think I've replaced it yet because <laughs> now I go, hey, I'm bringing the gong. And they go, uh, we haven't got the, uh, we haven't got the budget for that. You know, <laughs> you know uh, bringing a gong on a tour is like, okay, seriously. That's yeah. You're that's like, a big budget tour. Yeah. That's a, that's a real big budget tour. Yeah. Back in the day, man, we had like multiple setups, you know, of like, and I finally got rid of all those anvil cases literally like a couple of years ago and they were massive. I stored them for like 20 years, size of this house, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I, know. I sold my timpanis. I had timpani drums. Do you remember? I th- yeah, I think I do. With with the cult, you had like a like a. Two, they a came out of the riser, and then I had one yeah. next to me, like Bonham. I had like a more of a small. I think it was a twenty eight over there, and then I had the big guys. And we used to do one part in the show where it came out. And it was a song called Sun King, and I go boom, 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 boom. And it looked really cool. And then it went down and went away and into the massive semi truck, you know, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> once you're part of the show. But yeah, yeah, I ended up selling those to Josh Freeze for um for nine when he was in Nine Inch Nails. But I kept them for years. That's great. Never yeah. used them. Yeah, you know, but you're it's cool that you're talking about that because it was at a time when, like you say, there were like whether it was budgets or like if you said, I'm taking a gong and I'm taking timpani with me on the road, like they, they made it happen for you, right? I mean, that was how it was done back then, you know? Well, so, compared to Tommy Lee, I was lightweight, you know? I mean, could I imagine <laughs> walking in and going, hey, guys, I'm going to go up and down on a roller coaster and it's going to be like two semi trucks full of drums and, <laughs> and you're yeah, like, exactly. get out of here, you know? <laughs> I mean, I had a big drum riser, you know, I had a massive drum riser and remember that was my world me and timmy we had a tent behind it and i go down there and i remember the one thing i wanted was hey i go let's do like a beach island bar kind of thing back here <laughs> it's like can you get me like a really cool palm tree do like a tiki tiki kind of thing <laughs> so when slash would take his like 20 minute guitar solo i'd come down off the riser into this tent we had like tiki lights and we did make so some great. cocktails, you know, it was about, that was always around three quarters into the show. So I could, you know, have a few extra knowing we were coming towards the end, a little shot or something. <laughs> Occasionally invite friends in, you know, we'd have a little. So Timmy yeah. had that all set up and the, the riser was all mesh aluminum. So it was like metal and the drums would be all in the same spot every night. So they were all built into this metal, all the, every stand, but underneath it was hollow. Yeah. So I could, the, all the speakers were under there coming up at me. And then on each side of the riser were these, <laughs> basically I had my own PA. It was like, I, yeah. I saw you a couple of times and it was unbelievable. The production. <laughs> you came up I mean, on stage and sat on the kit and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't uh, a big kit, but it looked big because it was a simple setup, but I used big toms. I remember in right. those days they were considered what they, what they call concert toms or. Um, probably power toms, right? Power. Power they were toms. Like, extra. Yeah. Extra depth. Yeah. My first was like a 14, but it was like 13 inches deep, you know? Yeah. Yeah massive and the kick was a big 24 but it was i think 18 deep and then we had that huge yamaha rack thing with all the mics on it and and then the timpani and lots of little fidgety things like i had like uh i had a little uh side snare yeah meeting like joe bonton joe montanary Remember him? Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Great Joe stuff. Martin sat over there, and then some weird little like. I used to like to mess around with like jam blocks and a couple yeah. of yeah. funny little things. To get... <laughs> and <laughs> then on the right, I mean, yeah. Guns and Roses was famous for cowbell. So I yeah. every song, almost every song, had a cowbell in it. Right, right. And I remember thinking, is this the secret sauce? The cowbell. That's why it's a hit. It's, <laughs> it's the cowbell. <laughs> I always tell people, I'm like, think about it. I go, think about the cowbell. Think about the hits. Is it subliminal? Is it something that simple that makes it a hit? <laughs> it's the cowbell. It's the cowbell. Honky Tonk Woman. Cowbell. Hard Day's Night. Cowbell. American Band. Yeah, we're an American band, cowbell. Yeah. I mean, this this is one of those intros. I was like, 
as soon as you hear honky tonk woman and that cowbell part. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. People talk about these intros, these drum intros. They're like, Oh, rock and roll. Yeah. Okay. I know that one. But you think about setting up a song like that, you know, like a honky tonk woman. And it's just like, what? Yeah, I know. I mean, I know you got you had a really long lasting relationship with Charlie and man. Shit. I remember you telling me that story about when he called for the ride symbol. Yeah. Yeah. He was he was just an amazing, you know, it's 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 one of those things, Matt, too, where like I grew up, he was my hero, you know, as a kid growing up. So to to get to know him you know, at such a deep level and, and become friends was, you know, still something I, 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 I kind of can't believe sometimes, you know what I mean? I, I think about it and I go, man, he was just like, he wasn't putting me on, you know, I, you know, the first few times I kind of thought like, is he, is he kind of putting me on? He knows like I'm a, I'm a big fan and he's just, he's just being nice, but he was just that nice a guy, you know, he was just No, like, you were just in the guy. club, man. You were like, I met the guy once he blew me off. He was like, yeah, <laughs> but uh, he, he liked you, you yeah, know, it's right. like, it's weird. I'm like that with Ringo. I'm, he'll yeah. call me. It's so strange. I'm like, <laughs> I look That's... at the phone. It's like Richard S is calling. Right. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? That's so, so cool, I understand man. that feeling, you know, cause you know, it's just, you just blessed. It's just like, yeah, you got yeah, that moment right. with the, you know, and I think he probably just, he's one of those guys that remembers, you know, that you're the guy. I mean, the story you told me was he called you up at Zoltan and he goes, hello, uh, broken my ride symbol. It's a 20 inch with one rivet. And yeah. You're like, yeah. You're like this, is, <laughs> this is Mr. Charlie Watson. At first you want to hang up, right? You're like, someone's <laughs> messing with me. <laughs> right. But that's how it started, right? Is yeah, that, is that yeah, story? exactly. It was I, I, I got a hold of him through um, his late drum tech, Chooch McGee. I'd left a message at Ocean Way, and I told Chooch I had some old symbols that I wanted to send him, some some new old stock like vintage A's from the '40s. And Charlie called. You know, I sent a letter explaining what it was. And uh, and Charlie called and said, "I'd love to try the symbols. I've broken one." And it's a twenty a twenty inch swish with rivets all around it. And oh, it was a swish. It was a swish, huh. and, and I, always wanted, it was, I always thought it was a flat ride. <clears throat> and he was using he was using a flat later years later. I might have told you that story where his flat ride started to develop some cracks, and he called one day and he was a little he was really concerned about it. And we made it was what he used wasn't a Zildjian, but we tried to clone it, and we got pretty close. But he was able to his tech was able to sort of save the flat ride that he had, but he then had a backup and it made him feel a little more comfortable, you know, that he had something just in case. And you know how that goes. If you're, Oh, he loved, he played the same kick forever, forever. Right? Yeah, and forever. He, the story I heard, he didn't change the kick drum head for like 10 years. Right. Is that true? Yeah. I've heard that too. I've heard that too. I've heard that. But why change it? It sounds great. Yeah. He, you and know. he used to talk about how, you know, he'd compare old drums and old drum heads to like old shoes, you know, like they, they just feel better. They, you know, nothing fits better than like an old shoe. And, and, uh, yeah, he was, I mean, you know, he's a, he was a creature of habit like that. You know, he was, God, I mean, I know those nights when the kit's just perfect and it's, it's like whatever happened with that batch of drum heads. And I'm like, I'd say to Timmy some nights or other checks, don't change them. I love them. Yeah. Like, yeah, but the snare's got a little bit of a thing in it. I'm like, yeah, it's okay. Like, I mean, traditionally, when I was hitting hard like that, you know, be maybe every three days, we'd have to change everything. Yeah. yeah. But then along came, you know, obviously a much different drummer than Charlie was. He was like more of a jazz cat and he was, wasn't killing him, you know, but he just, yeah. just the tone was there and it was him. My thing. I had to smack them and right, right. Uh, that we ended up going over to Remo and coming up with that. I mean, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but in the early days we were like basically the guys that came up with the, uh, the Emperor X. I didn't know that. Yeah. 
I didn't realize that. Why? That was smacking through those things. And in the, in the days of, in that late eighties, early nineties era, it was pinstripes, man. Yeah, sure. For that flappy sound. that Yeah. And it sounded huge in a stadium, but then that snare drum had, I remember I went to an emperor, but it's, it kept dipping in the middle. Yep. And I was just playing big rock sticks and just. <laughs> so I, I'm like, well, you guys already have the CS dot. Let's, why don't we try dropping a dot underneath? So we did that. And then I don't think it's ever spoken about that. I took credit for that or my drum tech at the time, Mike Fasano. Yeah, sure. When we were in the studio, but wow. we ended up using it. And I kind of use it pretty much to this day. That's a popular uh, head too. That's, that's, it's a thing, you know, with drum heads, I always say to people, you know, oh, this sounds dead or it's too dead or go, go around and tap it first. The tone, check the tone. If the head's got tone, it's a good head. If it doesn't, if it sounds dead, got to move the plastic a little bit. Because in the old days in calfskin, that was a different theory. It, the, the head already had the tone. Yeah, yep. And they put That's it on right. there and you <clears throat> and tweak it. But then with Remo coming up with all the, you know, the way to glue it and everything, you still have to crack that glue. I would take them and, you know, go all the way around and then pop them on, stretch them. Yep. Get them going and then go around and tune every, t get as much tone as you could. Because I've seen guys throw them on there and just be like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no tone at all. And I was a sucker. I was a stickler for tone. Like a lot of people say, they love my toms on all that GNR, but it was a do, 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 you know. Yeah. Well, what, what you just said, Matt, about like sometimes you tell <laughs> me or your tech, like, you know, even though it's been a couple of days and the heads are a little beat, leave them on. Like, see, so that to me is the sign of somebody who who hears good. To like, you're not dictated by, oh, it's been two days. I got to change my heads no matter what, which we know lots of guys that do that. They just go, well doesn't matter what they sound like it's been two days i'm going to change them but you know you're you were basing it on the sound you were going man they sound too good i don't want to change these heads that's yeah when you find a guy that can tune like that you know i got i got a little bit spoiled because now i was in the big leagues yeah you know in the old days <laughs> when i was coming up in hollywood i had a volkswagen and right? <laughs> i had a vw the front seat was taken out Remember how you used to be able to take the back seat out and lay down seat yeah. in, a Volkswagen, in a Volkswagen bug? And I had the Man. kick drum was my passenger. Yep. And then the other drums would sit in back. I would just shove them all back there. And that's how I got around from gig to gig. And I set my stuff up. And then later on, I got a 64 Rambler station wagon. I was like, man, I can kick. And then the guitar player would be like, can you carry my amp too? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> no. But uh, but yeah, I mean, then when I got in the big leagues, I got a little lazy because I had Timmy. I mean, he was one of the greatest tuners. And yeah, great I, drum tech. I, I walk on stage. We didn't sound check. We would show up in the big stadium shows and just walk up and do the gig, you know, and I'd sit yeah. down and like, yeah. everything was just perfect. Perfect. You know, and, uh, and then later on, Timmy's like a big, big, uh, production manager now, Lenny Kravitz. And oh, Michael I didn't Clark. realize that. Oh yeah. He's in the big, he's big now. I can't even get him. In. He was with drum key. Are you kidding me? I don't touch that. <laughs> I thought I thought he was still. I knew he was working for Lenny Kravitz. He was drum teching for a while though, right? But he's but he was. Then he became production manager. Now he's production. Good for him, man. He deserves it. I mean, great guy. Those guys. I mean, some of the great techs of the world. I mean, he worked for you. He worked for Jimmy Chamberlain, Joey Kramer. He's worked for like the greatest drummers. You know. Yeah, yeah. After me, I think he went to Jimmy for a while. Then he went to Joey. And um, yeah, Timmy. Yep, yeah. that tells you. And you know, let's uh, let's talk Gretsch. I see your beautiful Gretsch drums back there. Yeah, I've I've got five other Gretsch kits, vintage kits. But these are my, these are the two I have in this room, and that's the left-handed one is the one that I practice on, and that one over here, the uh, 
that's called uh what's it called black oyster not black oyster um oh yeah black uh um, black pearl um or black diamond pearl Black Diamond Pearl. Thank you, Matt. That's a yeah. 62, that kit. So 62 Ooh. brown badge. So. That, yeah. Oh, brown badge. Ooh. Yeah. So I got a funny story about Black Black Diamond Pearl. So Hagi-san from Yamaha. I call Hagi-san, I go. Because I always played black drums, but I thought, man, mm. going out. So fast forward to the big Guns N' Roses Metallica tour where we're doing stadiums. Um, I think we played the big one there where the Patriots played. Yeah, you did. You played in Foxborough. Yeah. Uh, I call Hoggy Son. I go, Hoggy Son, I want to make Black Diamond Pearl drums. He says, Black Diamond Pearl. Okay, Matt. So we get to JFK Stadium in Washington, D.C. And we're doing pre-production. We've got like two days at the stadium, believe it or not, with full rigs. Yeah, I'll bet. And yeah. The drums show up in boxes from Japan. And uh we un- we unbox them. And they're baby blue. <laughs> and the crew's walking by and they're like, hey, let me, is there a girl drummer joining the tour? Is, let me know when he's come out of the man style. I swear to God, I was like mortified. I was like, oh. Uh. My God. I call Hoggy son. I go, Hoggy, I said black diamond pearl, not blue diamond. They had the same diamond in it, but it was yeah. blue. Oh. I was like, oh my God. And we set him up and I looked at him. I'm like, oh no. And I went to the lighting guy and I'm like, is there anything you can do? Can you hit me with like, what kind of light you got? Did, can you turn these drums black? <laughs> Timmy, can we, how, can we, what can we do? He's like, <laughs> everyone's laughing. <laughs> anyway, I ended up doing that whole tour on those drums. I think and I remember. I didn't, I didn't know the story, but I think I remember those drums. Yeah, they were, you know, in those days, that particular kid, I believe was a recording custom, but I, I endorsed it rock tour customs mm-hmm. but i i had that kit was made basically the same shells as like steve gatt or a guy like that played right. recording custom kit it was called and i believe it was mainly burt shell right that's right exactly and it was they were fat they were fat sounding drums and the snare i remember the snare i had a seven seven inch deep it was a custom drum by yamaha it was wood and also, I played the Zildjian Bell Brass. Do you remember that sucker? I do. Yes, absolutely remember that. Yeah, the Noble. And, and I still have that. I got that, and then I got the new one from the girls from Craigie and yeah, uh, the, the smaller new, one, the, right? I think. Yeah, but the big one I got in like the eighties. I remember that. Yeah, and did did we have to replace the shell on that one time? Did that? I feel like Timmy might have called me once about that too. That it was out around, wasn't it? Yeah, or did it crack or something? Because some of them did. Yeah, did they crack. did. You know what happened? It cracked right on the um Because I believe wasn't it? Uh, no one Cooley. It in a, uh, collaboration with No and Cooley. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yep. And, and big die cast hoops. Yeah. Something happened where they put the the uh, the lugs on, and a crack went across from one of the lugs. Yeah, and it happened on a few of them, Matt. It wasn't, you know, it was a semi-common that was the first production run of those that drum was, was i used it on the cult almost the great. whole tour the end, I, I remember it i totally do and I, I remember that yeah great sound and drum i want to jump yeah. backwards a second because something you said earlier and i and i wanted to pick up on this you mentioned because greg's told this story a few times greg bissonette our good friend yeah. um and all the years i've known you i you'd never mentioned it but i had greg on on my show last year and he mentioned auditioning for david lee roth and he said he he was going in as you were coming out or something or something along the lines. <laughs> and, and he said, and I said, I didn't know Matt auditioned for David Lee Roth. He said, well, Matt didn't play double bass drums. And so I think Greg had played some double bass drums and made oh a mental God. note to himself like that. Okay. And he, I think he wrote something out like a, I don't know, but he, like when he went in there, he was ready for it. Cause he, cause, cause of that information that you'd given him, I think as you were going, he was going standing yeah. in line when I walked out. 
Yeah, that's what he said. And you were like, man, I don't know. I, I think I, I don't think I'm going to get it, man. They, they wanted a guy that plays double bass drum. So, so literally when I came out that door, there was great bassinette and Mark Craney standing there. That's, that's wild. And, but no one knew it was for David Lee Roth. Right. That's the other thing. Right. We all got called by Steve Vai and we we're like, Steve Vai is that guy from Zappa? Yeah. So when, when I walked in, I went, it was very clinical. We were playing like crazy time signatures and it was very Zappa school. Like yeah. he was yep. running yep. me through the mill. Like, give me a seven, four. And I'm like, okay, Genesis cinema yeah. show. Yep. You know, I'm like, I got that. Okay. Then he said something like, play 26 over eight. Oh, and I was kind of cocky and I looked up and I went, why? Yeah, why? <laughs> and, we, and then I said, I saw Billy Sheehan sitting on the couch. I go, God, I'd love to jam. Can we jam? We didn't jam. Mm. I played by myself. And it was it was probably the craziest audition I ever did. I never had a situation where I had to stand there and Steve Vai was reciting all these notes and and like running me through this whole school of, you know. Yeah, yeah. And at that point in my life, I was priding myself on being a pretty pure rock and roll guy. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and then, but I looked at Greg Bissonnette and I knew he had all those other elements. Yeah. Of, yeah. You know, he's school, North Texas State, you know, and then Craney, same thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so you knew, cool. you knew Greg from LA at that, like you kind of, you already knew who him, who he was. And well, I was in a band with his brother, Matt Bissonnette. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. And was, so this there was this whole contingency of guys, right? In the mid eighties, there was Pat Torpy, you know, yeah. great drummer from Mr. Great Big. drummer. Yep. Great Bissonette and all these other guys. And then Matt Bissonette. And there was another bass player in town named Bob Birch who went on to play with Elton. Yeah. And we yeah. were kind of guys that would mishmash in other gigs. Like, and me and Greg were the drummers at Disneyland as well. Right, right. Which was Stan Fries, Josh Fries's father. Yep. And we would all, and Russ McKinnon, remember Russ McKinnon? Of course, yeah, yeah. We were the guys that played Disneyland. And then we would all sub for each other on other gigs. Like I would, we all had original bands, but Russ would call me and go, Matt, I got the, I got an original gig. Can you sit in for me at Disneyland? And we, we all knew Top 40. Yeah. So I go down to Disneyland and sit in for Russ. And then I sat in for Greg before. Greg sat in for me. Same thing with those guys. That's so cool. Greg would give me charts. And I'm like, oh, okay. You heard <laughs> Miami Sound Machine? Awesome. <laughs> uh, working for the weekend by Loverboy. Greg would chart it out. I'm like, cool, cool, cool. Cowbell. Working for the weekend. I'm like, Greg, I got this song. It's cool. Back of, back of, you know, it's like, <laughs> Like reading it, you know, like, like, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember one time <laughs> I, we, so there was three different stages at Disneyland, right? There was Tomorrowland. There was the big stage, the main, they called the main stage. Tomorrowland was the one that came out of the ground. You were like, and then we'd all run over and watch like Louis Belson at Carnation out, you know? Oh man. Buddy Rich. There was the yeah. jazz guys. So we'd all go, hey man, Louis Belson's playing tonight at Carnation Village. And you go over there, it was like the ice cream garden. Yeah. And they'd pay Louis Belson's band. Wow. And then Buddy was over there all the time. Yeah, yeah. And then I met a very, very young drummer, Josh Freeze, at the age of 15, he was playing there. Wow. And I remember going, who is this kid? Yeah, yep. And his father was the booker. Right. And his brother, Stan Freeze, and uh, another brother. Yeah. Keyboard player, I think, right? <laughs> yeah, he's in Green yep. Day now. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, and then anyway, or Jason, I think his name is Jason Freeze. And his yeah. dad's Yeah, Freeze. dad was Stan, yeah. So anyway, that's how we all were around, you know? And then everyone got great gigs. Like, but, you know, Greg took off with uh, David Lee Roth. Yeah. And very closely after that, and close to that era, I got the cult. So I was cool. It was the right band for me. It was the right band for him. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. I always say that to people. It's like, you know, you get these gigs, you get certain gigs that 
are going to line up the rest of your career. You know, I had opportunities to play with some bands. I'm like, hmm, I'm not sure if that's the right script for me. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's like, yeah. yep. not going to name names, but there was a couple of bands like, I think I'm just going to keep eating top ramen. <laughs> gonna just, you know, I'm going to. And, yeah, it was like, yeah, and then, yeah. you know, when the cult came, that set the tone for the rest of my career that I'm this kind of drummer. I'm a, I'm a rock drummer in this genre. And like, I think Guns N' Roses respected that I came from the cult. It might not be the same way if I was in a, maybe a different genre of a band. Yeah. Yeah. It can kind of come back to bite you. And, and, and when you, when they, if I remember correctly, when you joined Guns N' Roses, it was because were you guys on a bill together and they saw you play and, and kind of, I mean, did it happen that me or had they seen you play somewhere? Was it that sort of, yeah, they came out to the universal amphitheater. That's what it was. Okay. And I remember it's in my book. There's a whole chapter where they come rolling in. It was like a scene out of fast times at Ridgemont. Eye. it's like, yeah, it's like a cloud of smoke, you know, <laughs> I'll bet and at the time the Sonic temple tour was winding, winding up. Yeah. We'd been out on a pretty long year and a half tour. And I remember going, man. Yeah. As a joke, I said to my girlfriend, <clears throat> I said, look at those guys, man. They look like fun. And literally not long after that, Slash tracked me down through Lars Ulrich, who I wow. yeah. become quite good friends with. And at the time, I wasn't living anywhere. I didn't have a phone, it wasn't cell phones. I know, I know, yeah. You didn't so, call, you didn't text somebody. <laughs> it's like if you wanted to find somebody, you had to like call them on a landline. Yeah, and, and find out where them. they were, you know. And like you say, you he had to do some some tracking down <laughs> some Jim Rockford stuff to get. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember getting the call from uh, Mike Clink, the producer, and then called me and said, "Someone's going to be calling you," and I. I, was like, I couldn't think of who it would be and slash called me up and invited me to come up and you know initially and i've said this a bunch of times in the press and everything i was just going to play on the record and i'm steven adler was going to come back and then it we just all hit it off and it was weird because i was already in the cult and i had a great gig and i loved that band and a lot of people still say to this day that that was like the perfect band for me it was like my groove you know but i remember thinking opportunity wise i had to make i had to make the move and they, they made me a member which meant i wasn't a side guy yeah you know Huge. i was a member of the band i was in the photographs i got the percentage it was like all that kind of stuff i was starting to learn my way through the business yeah i can't say i did it perfectly but i was like Okay. And um, so I remember taking Billy Duffy to, to lunch and telling him, you know, hey, I got this offer. Hmm. It was it was hard. I bet. And then years later, I went back and I rejoined the cult. I remember that too. Yeah. I remember it's seeing great. you like years later with him. Yeah. We went back and I remember going back to them and going, you know, you guys can't make me a side man anymore. You know, I was just in that <laughs> other big band. <laughs> <laughs> and we just got to be a band. <laughs> and they're like, okay, mate, well, you'll be an equal, equal member. I'm like, great. Yeah. So I always say to a lot of drummers, drummers say to me like, you know, Matt, what did you do about negotiating your way into things? You know, I said, well, you gotta, if you don't ask, you don't get, so right. don't blow yourself out though. Be careful. It's like, it's a fine line. Yeah, it is. You know, it's like, I think for drummers, it's hard because I think the old pre the preconceived notion is that we're replaceable. It's going to be the first guy that's going to go, right? Yeah. We, need, we know we need the singer. We know we need the guitar player, probably. Bass player, man. Mm -hmm. Drummer, there's other guys. Yeah. So if you're a perfect fit and you feel like it's the, your band and the camaraderie is there and you guys have started maybe early together, that's a different situation. Then you have to just say, hey, I've been here huffing it with you guys from the beginning. 
But my situation jumping out of a band like the cult into GNR was I already had a band. I had a bit of a negotiating tool there because I wasn't just sitting on the sidelines going, Hey, you know, I don't have a van. So the worst case scenario was they say no. And I go back to playing in the cult and, but they, they were like, we want you. And Mm. it was great. They, they opened our, opened their arms to me and I had a great run with that band. Yeah, you did. And, and I'm, and I'm, I'm going to say, and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it started a lifelong friendship with Slash because you guys continue to play together and, and later bands and um, a collaboration anyway. I mean, like just there were like other things that you guys worked together on. Yeah, well, we had Velvet Revolver, which was a big success for us. Yeah, huge. You know, and that was an interesting time because we all went through periods of out exploring our musical after being in this massive machine of a band. Yeah. I remember when we broke up in the nineties, it was like, Oh my God, what are we going to do now? Right. You know, I remember getting some calls from <clears throat> bands and I was like, I got to figure out how to adjust to this. And I remember I got into doing film scores. I started dabbling and producing. I actually had some success producing mm-hmm. and yeah. To be honest with you, I wasn't sure if I could pull it off again. I was like, well, that was a fun run. I mean, how am I ever going to get to that level again? I don't think I, so why don't I just, you know, try some other stuff, do some other stuff. And then came full circle. I got back in the cult. We got a big record deal with Atlantic. And then, you know, Slash and Duff and myself kind of stayed close and, did stuff, but not in a big way. Yeah, yeah. And then in the early 2000s, we decided it's time for us to do a band. Let's do a band. And um, was, yeah, we, was, we ended up band. signing with RCA and, you know, one got three Grammy nominations, won a Grammy and sold about 4 million records. <laughs> and cool. had a really good, that was a quick, Lightning in a bottle run, though. It was like, boom. Yeah. And I remember when it hit, when we had a hit, which was a song called Slither, which we got the Grammy for. It was like literally going from like hanging out, waiting to get going again to like, it was on fire. Like, (laughs) like we were on a press tour for like three months and we were like on every magazine and it was like, the switch went on and we were like it and uh it was exciting i was like holy shit i can't believe we did this and it was probably for me one of the most exciting things that ever has happened in this, my career because we were in our 40s a lot of naysayers in hollywood were like hmm, mm-hmm. i don't care what band those guys were in it's kind of like they're getting a little older mm, rock them really and that's the kind of stuff you deal with in the business of music. Yep. And we proved them all wrong. And that was a real feather in our cap. And we looked great. We all got in good shape. Yeah. And it was all like, this has got to be. And I was fired up like a kid again. I was like, I felt like I was 20. It's like, ah. And it, it worked even harder because they always say the old expression is, the older you get, the harder you have to work. <laughs> and we did. Yeah, yeah. We worked hard at our appearance. We looked, worked hard on harder than ever. And I will give the props to Slash and uh because we were at rehearsal every day at 12 noon. We rehearsed six, eight hours a day. We were writing songs. It was like boot camp. Mm-hmm. Dedication. Um, yeah. And I'll say that to any young musician. They'll ask me, what do you think, man? I go, work your ass off. Right. It's not about your computer. Yeah. It's, this is like, go play all the time with other guys. Mm-hmm. And maybe if you're lucky, I think Kobe Bryant said it. He's like, if everybody else is practicing twice a day, I'm practicing four times a day. And we did. And it wasn't like, it wasn't even about like 
being the drummer that had all the chops in the world. It was more about being a band that had the chops together. Yeah. I think Charlie Watts would say that. Charlie Watts is the guy that's the band. He's not doing anything fancy. He's just cool. And Charlie was the foundation of the Stones, man. He was like, it all started there. Like you said, honky tonk woman or whatever he came in like. Yeah, yeah. And that unit of a band is what made the magic. So I think my career came up with that sort of mindset. Like if you find the magic, just nurture the magic and just work on getting the best songs, you know. That's that's great advice, Matt. That is, that's, I it, you know, it seems so simple, but in this world of like YouTube and, you know, where you can, you can post drum solos all day and social media, it's just so simple that the importance of playing with other musicians, man, just like learning yeah. how to play in time with a bass player and having it feel good and groove. And, and, and I was going to point out too, when you mentioned replacing drummers, um, I think you'll agree with this. You, you sing, you're, you're a great singer. I mean, you, I've seen you and all your bands sing backups yeah. and, uh, and that's a great, you know, it makes, gives us drummers more value. You know, it's not like you can just easily replace a singing drummer, you know, when you're, when you're vocal. Right. Well, I always see, I came up in the school of like, you had to have extra attributes to offer. Yeah. So for instance, like if I were looking for a guitar player in a band or bass player we'd say hey does he sing yeah we were singing harmonies and background vocals and so i say to young musicians they say hey you know try to have as much stuff to offer as possible i mean you know if you can sing cool that's just another you know thing you can offer the the group and i sang i i enjoyed singing in all my bands plus gave me a real good sense of, of meter yeah and like tempo because if you're playing too fast and the vocals doesn't fit within that tempo, you're not listening. Yeah. And I think if you look at drummers like Ringo and some of those great drummers that have set up for the, for the vocal. And I've talked to Ringo about this. He said, well, listen to the vocal. Don't step on the vocal. Yeah. Exactly. Don't step on the vocal. Like if you're listening to the vocal, you're going to set it. You're going to put some stuff around that vocal or, or launching into that chorus and setting up that big chorus, you're gonna you're gonna set it up really cool with a fill and then boom. Yeah. And then you know, the solos come and build it, and then bam, then you're up on the ride, and you're like, you know, it's all about the dynamics and the tempo of the song. And that's I pride myself on being just a song drummer. That's all I am. I'm not like fancy pants, you know. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I can do some stuff, but uh, it's not my it's not why I get hired to play with bands. Yeah, I think yep. you look at me like Matt's got great meter. He looks pretty good. He's not a bad looking dude. He's like, you know, it's like Solid he hits them right. He yeah. hits them, you know, yeah. he, he keeps good time and his great dynamics and drive the band. Your job as a drummer is to drive the band. Right. You're in the driver's right seat. And yep. So guys are out there making fancy pants videos on YouTube. I'm like, <laughs> you see these kids, and I'm like, oh my god, I could never ever play any of that shit. <laughs> yeah, I know, me too. <laughs> but the thing, the problem with that is when they go to play for some big artists and they're doing all that shit, they're probably going to turn around and go, "Don't do any of that." That's right. <laughs> exactly. All exactly. that stuff you just did, don't do any of it. Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. I got to point out too to everybody. Um, what you just said, and, and I know we're getting close to the time on this thing, but um, I want to point out, if people haven't heard you play, on the Buddy Rich uh, Memorial, the Buddy Rich uh, Big Band record that you oh, did yeah, in the yeah. 90s, yeah, you played some ridiculous shit. And I remember we came in, it was while the Modern Drummer Festival was happening. It was yeah. like happening, because you played at the festival that weekend. I remember that. A bunch of yeah. you guys did. And then Neil Peart was producing it at a studio in New York City. A bunch yeah. of us came in. I remember I, I came in the studio when you were tracking. Oh, um, I remember I was in there watching you, and I think you and Kenny might have recorded the same day. 
possibly yeah. than Kenny Erna. It was and great. I've, yeah, and I've never heard you play like that, Matt. I'd never. And then I saw you play at the at the actual concert that they did in New York, like maybe. Oh yeah, that year. me and Kenny that? and Omar Hakim and Rod Morgan. Yeah. Neil Pert was there. And Neil Pert was there, and we we hung out at the Paramount. That was one of the craziest hangs of our lives. No, I mean, as you know, John. Oh, my, oh yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Can't even, I don't even think that's in the book. It shouldn't be because people could lose their jobs maybe as a result. We got hammered. <laughs> oh man. Uh, I, you were going to say something, but I. What was I, our old buddy? What was our old buddy from Zildjian? Lenny. Oh, Lenny Demuzio. Rest his oh. soul. Lenny was there that night. God, I got him hammered that night. I know you did. You got us all here. I, okay, if you're yeah, gonna tell us, great. you, so everybody watching this, Matt, <laughs> you were you were buying rounds of Jägermeister for everybody. I mean, it was oh, just like that was in a bad, bad way. Then it was I, bad. That's a lot of that's in the book. When you read the book, yeah, I go a little off the rails, and the wheels come off a little bit. But well, you were a generous guy. You were always like a. Generous it happened. Guy. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I love that night. I remember that night. You know, I was going to say real quickly, yeah, that was an amazing, amazing opportunity as a drummer that maybe wasn't recognized as that style of drummer. So I got the call from Kathy, who I'd met at NAMM or one of those. And she calls me, says, Matt, we'd like to have you on these buddy tribute records. And I was like, at first I was like, oh my God, you know. Yeah. It was that call you get where you're challenged and initially fear sets in <laughs> and she says neil pert's producing and i'm like oh even double fear like, yeah. <laughs> and then she starts late naming off the list of people that are on the record steve gad oh! <laughs> omar Fair. hakeem oh my god <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you know dave weckle you know these guys Vinny caliuda i'm like why me that's because we want a rock guy. Yeah. We yeah. want a rocker. It was smart. It really was. And then I go, okay, let me check out. Let me listen to Buddy's stuff. Okay. Early 60s. Hmm. Bula Witch. Funky Jam. Had like a <clears throat> kind of a funk rock beat. To, it had swing, mm -hmm. but it was rocking, wasn't it? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. And he explored that, you know, he went from his big band swing era into the sixties, started dabbling in all different rhythms, different stuff. And I'm like, yep. I'll do Bula Witch. I can bite that off. And Killed it. I remember walking in and Dave Wackles walking out and he's holding like his sticks and he's got his thing. And he goes, you got your charts. And I actually had a Sony Walkman on. And I was listening to Bula Witch. And I go, no, but I got this Walkman. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember we set up at the power station in New York. And I walked in and the whole band was there. And they were looking at me like, <laughs> all tattooed and stuff. I'm walking in, you know, like, I've been up all night, a little puffy, <laughs> drinking too much beer. Because I was nervous. I couldn't sleep. Yeah, yeah. I was on tour and I remember I flew in it, got picked up by Buddy's driver in his little old limo. Wow. And he's like telling me these stories. I've been Buddy's driver for oh, since the 60s, blah, blah, blah. So I'm in this old limo driving through New York. And anyway, we go upstairs and I walk up to the band and uh, Steve Markison. Oh, yeah. God, listen man. to the solo he did on that. It's like, yeah. <clears throat> guitar players can listen to that solo and interpret some of the greatest notes that they could take into this yeah and anyway i i walked up to the band i go can you give can you guys give me like four bars at the top and they go well four bars huh <laughs> <laughs> and i go do do and i remember it kicked in and the horns were coming at me. It was like so power that my initial reaction was, listen, play. Yeah. And yeah. 
it was like listening to another musician in a rock band, except it was coming at you like a freaking freight train. Yeah, man. Yeah. Right. And my limbs were just like, I was like, what the hell's happening? I looked over, there was a poster of Buddy on the wall. And I oh, said, man. thank you for possessing me. I'm not you. I'm never going to be you. Nobody's you. But Neil walked out and he said, wow, we got it. I said, what? One take? One take, yeah. One take. First Holy take. Holy shit. I was going to ask you how many <laughs> takes. Wow. We did, we did an extra. He goes, let's do one for safety. But I think that's the one. I was like, I looked at Neil. I'm like, I'm looking at Neil Pert going, are you, are you, you're kidding, right? Wow. I missed a couple of things. It was a little like ramshackle in a couple of spots. But in general, it's almost like, well... Yeah, like a nice magic to it. Yeah. I, I, and I was I was there when you did. I remember, I know I either heard the playback there or I was there when you did it. But, um, And I remember, honestly, how blown away all the guys in the band were with you. Because I think, you know, without sounding like they were being judgy, I think they probably, they probably saw judgy. the tattoos. <laughs> yeah, they, they, I don't know. They, they, I don't think they realized that you'd be able to pull it off the way you did. You know, I think they thought, well, yeah. yeah it's going to be good to have him. He's going to help sell a lot of records because he's a famous drummer. Yeah. Um, and, but yeah, know, I'm sure there was preconceived notion. I mean, yeah. When you're, when you're a rock guy, especially from a band like Guns N' Roses, you know, there's a, there's a thing that's like, man, do these guys play good? Are they? Yeah, exactly. You know, can they play? Or, um, and I think, you know, I've morphed into so many different styles of music. It's like, for me, it was like, I'm just going to listen and be more yeah. as best I can be inside the music. You know, it's like, it's almost like the way I have to play for Billy Gibbons. Now I go back to a whole different style. I, I'm, a, I'm actually playing a style of music that I grew up with. I, I cut my teeth down in Louisiana in a blues band, three piece blues band when I was 19. Wow. You I, know, know I was that. playing the blues and then that blues and Texas shuffles. And then that kind of, I didn't need it for 30 years. Yeah. I didn't use it. I played big rock shuffles, but I didn't play the Texas shuffle. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I remember going, okay, here comes Billy. I better go, which at this, which as a lot of drummers know that Texas stuff is not the easiest shit to play. And it's more subtle. No. It's like there's subtleties. It's not big rock at all. That's right. And it's it's almost like the opposite, Matt. Really, when you think about it, it's like you're playing all those like ghost notes with your left hand, and you know where you're playing like these big slamming, you know, two and four quarter notes with rock. You got to play all those little ghosty things, you know. Yeah, I think for a lot of drummers, like if you think about stylistically on drummers and guys that are jazz drummers and they're so great at playing jazz, they can't launch into maybe what I do. Right. And the same says in the same respect it's very difficult for me to go back into the subtleties of what they do. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we all have our sort of unique position. You know, it's like there was a point in my life when, you know, I was listening to it. Like I described, I was listening to Al D. Miola and return to forever and Lenny white. And my friends came over and they're like, Matt, you can't go into jazz fusion, man. You got, you got to play Sabbath, us, you know? <laughs> And at that point, I had to make sort of a overall decision about this is going to be who I am. Yeah. And that's what I sort of focused my, you know, what style I was going to be in into. Yeah, your and, direction. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think maybe drummers look at it like, well, it's just straight rock. I mean, it's really like, you know, it's not a bit lot to it. Meat potatoes. Mm. But... Ask Phil Rudd, he'll tell you. That's I mean, right. There's no, one, there's no one like Phil Rudd. Uh, when Phil Rudd's not in ACDC, in my opinion, it doesn't sound like ACDC. Yeah, exactly. And and just John Bonham. Right. John Bonham. Okay. Did he have elements of R and B? Did he have a lot of swing? There was jazz in there. Yes. Bill Ward, jazz drummer. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Bro. So, still, I'd say to rock young rock drummers. Go listen to all that shit. Listen to Gene Krupa. 
listen to, you know, these guys take yeah. everything that you can from everything. It's like a smorgasbord. Yeah. You know, that's great advice. And, and I know we're, we're, you've gone a long time and I really appreciate it. <clears throat> and, and you probably need a glass of water, but I want to just ask, um, yeah, good. Have some water. The, the name of the book. It's called yeah. double talk and jive. Double talk and jive. I love it. And the reason it's called Double Talk and Jive is it's a song on Fusion Illusion that me and Izzy Stradling recorded. And it starts out on the floor, Tom. And uh, I remember thinking, that just basically says it all. Mm. Double mm -hmm. talk and jive. Double talk and jive. I have. Yeah. <laughs> I I should have got these ready behind me in that pile of records that I have yet to put on my wall down here. Mm -hmm. I have both use your illusion, use your illusion one and two, uh, platinum multi platinum records that you sent me. Uh, nice. Many years ago, you came to my office at Zildjian. This would have been, um, I'm thinking like early '90s because those those records came out in '91, '92, '91, yeah. and mm -hmm. you were on tour. I came to see you at the Boston garden. Then you came to Zildjian and you looked in my office and you said, where's your guns and roses records. And I said, I don't have any. And you made a phone call. I swear uh, to God, you made a phone call. And like, and, and, and like you said, in those days we didn't have cell phones. Like you called a number and like four days later they showed up. Wow. And I so appreciate that. And I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't, I should. Well, next. Time I like I how you have them all leaning up there. It looks cool. Well, thanks, buddy. They're they're there, and I'm proud of them. And well, a recording I'm, studio here in the desert, I'm gonna have a full drum room. It's gonna be sick. So I have this Duco Gretsch kit that they made yeah. for me. Beautiful. They're, they're Brooklyn's. Yep. Great recording drums. I just did a soundtrack for a movie with the Shooter Jennings Whalen's kit on those Ducos, and I'm like, whoa! They're not older drums, but they sound killer. Yeah. yeah. Got a big yeah. Duco kit. And then I'm going to have a little broadcaster kit that's green. It's a Cadillac green. I'm going to have a small kind of setup that can do thumpy, like Ringo kind of stuff. And then I'm going to have a big rock kit out here in Palm Springs. Beautiful. And we'll be able to, you know, if you're ever swinging through town, come check it out. Absolutely. Absolutely. But Matt, thank you so much for, for being here today with me. I so appreciate it. And No, I mean, I'm so happy to see you. I've always loved you, man. And oh, thank you. You're really one of the early supporters of the Matt Sorum uh, project. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. I, I, well, I feel the same way about you. You know, I, I yeah. we met when I was just kind of on my way in the, into the business. So, you know, I feel like we, we really bonded immediately and, and here yeah. we are, you know, all these years. We've had, we've had pretty, been a pretty good life so far. Yeah. Yep. We've been. Thanks, we've been man. I'm really glad, glad to see you, and we were able to reconnect and, you know, Me talk too. talk shop, drums, for music, life. Great. Likewise, too. Well, hang tight. I'm gonna. I'll end the the recording, and uh, thank everybody for watching. A big hand for Matt Sorum. As Ringo would say, peace and love, peace and love. Peace. Peace and love, peace and love. And don't forget to pick up Matt's book. It'll be available by the time you see this. And it's Double Talk and Jive, and it's probably going to be on Amazon and anywhere you can, yeah. can, can find it. So, great. All right, well, hang tight one second, Matt, and we'll, uh, we'll end the, uh, cool. the broadcast. Thanks again, buddy. Great to see you. Nice.